I think what makes Young Frankenstein stand apart or stand above is, is how well Mel Brooks and his entire team recreated the look and the sound of the original Frankenstein movies. We were brought in and shown the picture of the original um, Frankenstein movie, and I think that's what he said they wanted, the feeling of to be and wanted it black and white. I understood. I think the inspiration for Young Frankenstein was obviously the first three films made in the 1930s by Universal Pictures, and all three of them featured uh, Boris Karloff playing the Frankenstein monster. Uh, in those, there are some very iconic scenes that people remember that stick in their minds. Uh, uh, the, the little girl by the lake in the first one, the creation sequence in the second one, uh, the business with the hermit who is blind and can't tell who the monster really is in the second one, which is the Bride of Frankenstein, and the character of the inspector in the third one with the uh, wooden arm. That the basic setup, of course, is from Son of Frankenstein, with Gene Wilder reprising uh, an over-the-top steroid version of Basil Rathbone's hysterical Wolf Frankenstein. Wilder actually bears a superficial resemblance to Rathbone with the aquiline nose, and all you need is the little pert dark mustache, and you've got a great stand-in. In Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, there's a mobile bookcase you must go through to find where the secret diary is hidden. They discover Baron Frankenstein's original diary, which I believe is called The Secrets of Life and Death. And of course, as Terry Garr and, and Gene Wilder find it. It's called How I Did It. Uh, you can't get more basic than that. Mel Brooks, of course, was brilliant enough to recognize the, the value of making the film in black and white and what a horrible mistake it would have been to, to make it in color. We were all there at Columbia, Mike Gruskoff, Gene Wilder, and myself. And they said, OK, we're going to do it. It's a million seven. I said, I can't make it for a million seven. I need two. I just. I, it's got to be more beautiful than you think. I said, I can't. They said, no, no, you got to do it for 1750. So just before the meeting ended, I said to the executives of Columbia, by the way, you know, it's got to be in black and white. Silence. <laughs> hey, no one ever said anything about black and white. Peru just got color. You know, what are we talking about here? <laughs> Don't be silly, you know. It's going to be in color, you know. I said, no, it's not. It's going to be in black and white. They said, it's, well, it's not going to be a Columbia picture if it's in black and white. I said, then it's not going to be a Columbia picture if it's black and white. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to Columbia, but known to Alan Ladd Jr., who was taking over 20th Century Fox and who, and who had been a, a, an agent Together with Gruskoff, Laddie read it and said, I'll make it. I'll ma I, you know, it, it, make it a Fox film. I'll do it in black and white. I'll do it for whatever it costs. You know, if it costs 50 million, whatever, you know. In those days, pictures cost between one and two million, you know. So anyway, I said, you know, I think I could do it for two, maybe two, two. He said, do, do, please. When I've told people that I was on the set for Young Frankenstein, it sounds like, you know, you were on the set of like Gone with the Wind or something. What I was was a 14-year-old kid who, who was into comedy, uh, wanted a career in comedy. So by sneaking onto the set of Young Frankenstein, I was continuing my education, basically. It was 1974, so studio security was pretty bad, in all honesty. I mean, now it's very tight security. I mean, they shoot you when you walk on the lot, basically, if you, you know, scratch your nose. So, but I just walked on, and it was a magnificent thing to, uh, to witness. You walked into 20th onto the stage, huge stage, and there's the castle, the outside, you all saw it, in the, and you go through the front doors, and there's this gigantic castle hall with a fireplace and a place to eat over there. It's, and all of the uh, little details and the stone gargoyles, wonderful ones. And everywhere you looked, it was authentically ancient and and eerie and, and deep, I mean, profoundly well-made, you know, lasted centuries and hundreds and thousands of years. In Young Frankenstein, we arrive in Transylvania. No Universal Frankenstein picture ever took place there. They were in either Viseria or Goldstadt or the town of Frankenstein. But in a popular mind, Transylvania is where it all happens. All the monsters come from there. And Brooks has very carefully recreated that world in the, in the fog-bound, 
black dead trees and night. There's never any sunlight, per se, in that world, just as in the universal pictures as they evolved. You rarely ever had a sense of, of normal daylight. Everything was stylized. Everything was studio-created in the aid of putting it over a mood. It was amazing to be on a set and look like, you know, this was literally look like Transylvania. The first person I met uh, was Marty Feldman who was in the full makeup of Igor, and he just locked eyes on and just came up really close, and his first words were, you're not supposed to be here, are you? <laughs> and I couldn't lie to him, I said no. And he, he knew what was going on. It was like telepathy, he recognized what was going on, and uh, he said, you can stay as my guest. He didn't have any kids, and so I think that was interesting because he mentored a lot of people. He had a natural parental thing about him, but he was the most open and honest and kind of kind person I'd ever met in Hollywood, and the cast all loved him. They seemed to all love each other, but, uh, but in particular, you know, Marty was like some real-life E.T. You know, it's tough, you know, not to love him, you know? Mel Brooks just addressed me indirectly. He said, be inconspicuous, kid. So, which was really sweet and really cool and says something about him because I tell you, any other director in town would throw a kid sneaking in off the set and letting, you know, and that was amazing. It says something about him because he's still a street fighter. He respects people trying to get in from the outside. I know there's no such thing as a bad fan encounter story about Mel Brooks. When I worked with him later, or trying to have lunch, and it was being interrupted every 30 seconds by somebody coming up to give him a compliment, ask for an autograph, and he was always gracious and fulfilled every request and personalized it, too, you know, and interact with the people. And I said, does ever bug you? And he said, what? And I said, you know, getting interrupted, signing autographs. He went, nope. I said, never. And he says, nope. I said, really? And he goes, nope. He goes, small price to pay for the life I lead. Every bit of it, 100% from the beginning to the end, was fun for me. I guess, and there was a wonderful woman, Dorothy Jeekins, who did the costumes. She was recommended by Anne, who had the best taste in the world, and Bancroft, and she um, gave me this dress for the opening scene in The Hay. What would you like to have a role as a hay? Um, and it was gonna be, I have to wear stockings and garters and have a short skirt and a push-up bra. So I said, how's all this gonna show in one shot? Well, he figured out a way. So good. I was glad it all worked. Dorothy Jenkins, a genius, genius. Her costumes, Dorothy Jenkins were, were William Ivy Long did the costumes for Young Frankenstein on Broadway and did the costumes for the producers and won many Tonys and many, many out of, out of circle critics awards. He's really very talented. And I said, not meaning to catch him or anything, I said, but, uh, who was your favorite costume designer? And, you know, was it Edith Head? Was it, you know? In all of Hollywood, he said, Dorothy Jenkins. I said, it's just because you're doing Young Frankenstein. He said, no, she always was. She was the best. So it was amazing to get two geniuses in my life to do costumes, you know. The grave robbing sequence is from the very beginning of the first film, Frankenstein. It's the first time that you see Dr. Frankenstein and Fritz on camera. And for that time, it was a very shocking scene for audiences to see them uh, uh, invading a, a cemetery after a funeral has taken place and uh, opening up a grave. Down, down, you fool. If you look at reviews of the time, the contemporary reaction was really quite strong. And uh, I think James Whale had a sense of the imagery and how it was going to affect audiences. Uh, he was after shock value. Uh, he got it. He's just resting, waiting for a new life to come. Mel is a perfectionist. If he knows it's going to be committed to film and it'll be there forever, he won't let go until he thinks it's the best it could be. Mel Brooks is I love that man. <laughs> I really do. He he scared the crap out of me because I, you know, the first couple of days of rehearsal, I'd be like, <sighs> yeah, I was like so afraid that I wouldn't be funny enough or that I wouldn't be clever enough. I think the secret to his success is whimsy and fun and not taking himself too seriously and uh, just willing to make a fool of himself. 
One of the classic set pieces in the 1931 Frankenstein is the procurement of a brain for the, for the creature. In it, Dwight Fry, who is uh, Dr. Frankenstein's assistant, goes to the uh, 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 classroom where they've been discussing abnormal brain uh, patterns as opposed to normal brain patterns. Of course, he originally tries to steal the normal brain, but then drops it on the floor. So he goes back and takes the other one, not realizing what it is. In Young Frankenstein, the assistant's name is Igor, but in the first film called Frankenstein, uh, uh, the assistant is actually named Fritz. A character named Igor shows up in the third film of the series, The Son of Frankenstein. He's played by Bela Lugosi, but uh, obviously there's a melding of those two characters because he's got Lugosi's name in the Mel Brooks version. Marty was into jazz, and so he could change things subtly, and he was playing around with stuff and coming up with business. Uh, and you know, he was unpredictable. Looking at him, you, would, you could never imagine him being kept behind the scenes, but he made his name in uh, the UK as a writer first. His career was actually, Marty was like considered the, he was like the British equivalent of Woody Allen. Somebody was like the comedy writer's writer and then was thrust into performing. He was not self-absorbed. He genuinely liked people. And he was just this rare human being that what you saw is what you got, which was somebody to love. He is Igor. He's absolutely Igor. So uh, when I did the musical and we, we hired this kid, Christopher Fitzgerald, I jumped over to Forest Lawn Cemetery to see Marty. And he's, uh, he's buried there near Stan Laurel, his idol. Marty is right near Stan Laurel. And I uh, sat on his grave and I talked to him. I said, you won't be unhappy. This guy, Christopher Fitzgerald, is great. You, you'll love his performance. Not as good as you. He's still, he's still talking to an actor, you know. <laughs> Dead or not, you're talking to an actor. They're very sensitive about, you know, who's better. But I, but I just apologized to him for his not being in the show and, and explained how good Chris Fitzgerald was or else I wouldn't have hired him, and, you know. And he's, um, he's in my heart. He'll always be there. Probably the most famous sequence in the 1931 Frankenstein is the creation sequence. Uh, uh, there had been nothing quite like it on screen at that point, certainly not on the talking screen. And so there needed to be a lot of fireworks, a lot of noise. There are two great creation sequences in the Universal Frankensteins, the original one with Karloff and then the creation of the bride in 35, which is even more spectacular for pyrotechnics and camera work. It becomes a little mini symphony of, of sight and sound. It's coming up! They had the kites and they had uh, various devices that lit up and moved that uh, the prop department came up with. <laughs> Brooks chose to do it. I think he was trying to encompass or embody all of the creation scenes that had occurred in those 1930s films. The laboratory set, he found um, the prop guy who had originally worked on the movies, and the stuff was still existing in this guy's garage. He said, can we use it? And the guy said, oh, yes, of course. Kenneth Strickfadden. It was great stuff, that spinning thing, and oh, gosh. Where do you, will you house it into what, your garage, your attic? Where do you put that? It's huge and very effective. And oh, it, you know, it made noises. And it was a living thing. What Brooks does in this is he keeps the operatic quality by having Gene Wilder actually get onto the platform. We originally stayed below and watched the creation happening from the ground as, as, the, uh, as the table had gone up through the roof where it engaged the heavens. I could have been a doctor. I could have been as good as any one of these bad doctors that, that are, you know, that are all around the place. When I was a kid, doctors had to do a lot. They actually had to, sometimes they'd operate on you, and sometimes they'd, um, they'd straighten out a, your shoulder. Or they, I mean, they did everything. Today, <laughs> the, what, are, what are we talking about, 2008? You go to a doctor, and he says, uh, what, you know, what is it? And you say, well, I, I don't know, the right side of my nose. He says, okay, go see this guy, you know? Or you say, well, why did you come here? Well, I, you know, I'm walking funny. I think it's my right. He says, okay, go see this guy. Your GP, your general practitioner, your internist, he just has a desk and a phone. And the minute you come in, he refers you to whose ever department, you know, I, they don't do anything.
Sometimes they take your blood and they send it to a laboratory, you know? So it is different. I would have been a, an old-fashioned, I think an old-fashioned country doctor who uh, would have, you know, smelled your breath to see whether you were drunk or not, you know? Or I could have been that kind of guy, you know? The major element that comes in Young Frankenstein from the 1939 film, The Son of Frankenstein, is the character of the inspector with the wooden arm. That's Kenneth Marr's character. That's based on Lionel Atwell's character in the 1939 film. Inspector Crow, District Police. He's got a, a wooden arm because uh, it gets pulled out by the roots by the monster. Oh, can I give you a light? Thank you, no. Wolf and Krog have a dart game which uh, is really a, a cat and mouse battle of wits. Have a drink? Thank you, no. Heard I require all the wits I've got tonight. The dart game is the metaphor they're, they're using to exchange who, how much do you really know and what are you really doing. Um, Brooks subverts this by making the dart game more important than the subtext, with the uh, Inspector Kemp character determined to cheat. Mel started out as a drummer, and he has this thing about rhythm, and the, the jokes, the comedy is rhythm, and he's right. You know, that's the comic line. You, you can have a line, and if the uh, correct rhythm isn't there, people won't laugh. And Mel no, instinctively knows that. He can also sing. He's also a natural actor. He's a natural comic. He, when he was a drummer up in the, in the Catskills as a kid, and then the, the comic got sick, and he jumped in and became the comic. And also, he's a tremendous writer. The thing is that Mel is not somebody who sits alone in a room with a typewriter or a computer and writes. This is old-style talk. He and I talk when we write together. And then the secretary will write something down. We say, no, don't write that down. That stinks, you know. And, uh, or I'll go home and type up something he said, a few things he said. We put them together. Well, I'm considered the grandfather of, of, of uh, takeoff movies, of, of, of caricature movies, of movies that, that make fun of genres, the genre. And, I'm, I, and I want to apologize. About, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I started it, because it's, it's, uh, it's gotten out of hand. That's all I can tell you. The scene with the monster and the little girl is from the original Frankenstein from 1931, and that's Marilyn Harris that uh, played the little girl. Who are you? I'm Maria. Will you play with me? In his innocence, he would play a game with the child, and then his confusion would come in when the flowers are all gone, and he has nothing to throw into the water except the little girl, and so he does that as well. Children are always the first to have sympathy for the monster, and the filmmakers that made those films understood that because every one of the key Frankenstein pictures includes an encounter with a small child who is never afraid of the monster, whether it's Maria in the first film, uh, whether it's Donnie Dunnigan, whether it's, it's little uh, Peter Frankenstein, son of Frankenstein, or the little Janet Ann Gallo girl in Ghost. They know intuitively that the monster is one of them, a child. Peter Boyle's performance, I think, the most effective thing is is the innocence and the and the realism that he gave the uh, creature, and I think that's really really important because it's it's pretty much the character that to hook people into the story, they need to have some sort of vested interest in. They need to relate to them, and that's done within the first few moments of meeting the creature. And there's something just in the movement that, that needs to be um, created that people are like, well, yeah, that's not a bad monster. And he did that so classically. He was so wonderful with that little girl. He wouldn't sit down on that, on that uh, seesaw because he knew that he was too heavy. And she kept insisting, and finally when he sat, you know, he knew she'd go flying, and she did, and that, that's a wonderful little moment. To James Whale, the most important single scene in The Bride of Frankenstein, or the one he lavished the most attention on, was the scene between Boris Karloff as the Frankenstein monster and the blind hermit, who was played by an actor named O.P. Hagee. What's the matter? Ah! You're hurt, my poor friend. Hagee was working on another film when they were making The Bride of Frankenstein and wasn't available when they were ready to do that scene. So James Will shut down production, which was something that was unheard of at that time, and waited for him. It took almost two weeks to get him. He wanted two very top drawer actors playing that scene because it's essentially just the two of them. Smoke, you try. 
Oh. <laughs> he's nurtured, he's fed, he's nursed, he's put to bed. And um, Ave Maria by Schubert is used as a beatific background. Or, or you can almost feel, you know, nuns parading up with incense burners around it. At the end of the scene, you know, a crucifix illumines the entire sequence. Well, Brooks takes this and he has a party with it. Gene thought he'd work two hours and I had him there for 10 days. And in the end, he loved it. And he, and, and, and he, he turned out to be a magnificently good comic actor because he played it earnestly. When he spilled the hot soup on the monster's crotch, he was doing it, he, he was aiming for the bowl, you know, as, a, as any blind man would, you know? And it was just one of the most terrific scenes. When I realized that that was Gene Hackman <laughs> as, the, as the blind hermit, I couldn't believe it. I, I just couldn't believe that was him. It's funny how this movie and this show take the weirdest character, takes the creature, the most grotesque, uh, inhuman person in the show and makes him the most human and actually makes him the straight guy. So that's funny right there to have all these crazy people around just sort of doing strange things to this poor innocent creature. I went to a revival screening in the 80s of um, Bride of Frankenstein. It was a double bill of two Boris Karloff movies. He was at the New Art. And this is the impact of Young Frankenstein. When the blind man scene came up from the original, I started laughing, you know, instantly. When they saw it, and they were laughing all through it. It was subliminally, you knew what everybody was, was thinking, you know. So that, to me, was hilarious, because it was like this inside joke. Gene came up with brilliant ideas. The one thing I wouldn't do with Young Frankenstein was putting on the Ritz. He's, he thought it was a great idea. I said, no, it will tear it. It will, if we're going to salute un the universal movies of the 30s, if we're going to salute the essence of Frankenstein, it's too much fun. It's over the top. And Gene was very smart. And Gene said, OK, do me a favor, Mel. You're the director. You're the boss. Film it. And then we'll just toss it out of the film so that you know, it, it, will just be, it will just be a thought that will end up on the cutting room floor. So we filmed it, and the minute we saw it, we said, this is the best thing in the movie. And Gene was, Gene Wilder, he was absolutely right. Mel had told me all about the film, and uh, I believe they had started to shoot. I was in New York. And he said, look, can you come out here and help me out with this number? Because they were shooting, Gene and Peter Boyle were on the set in costume and makeup. After they finished a scene, I got about 15, 20 minutes rehearsal with the two of them. Then they had to go back on the set. And it, it was tough, but um, they kept at it. So we, we did it in 20 minute segments of rehearsal. And they finally had it before we had a shoot. The absurdity of it is, it's so fantastic. And the seriousness of it, that's what makes it so funny. They take it so seriously. We had a group in at the theater the other night, and I was saying, they were saying, were you worried about it being over the top? And I said, well, Mel generally starts at over the top and then sees where we can go from there. And it, it's kind of how he runs rehearsals and runs, uh, it runs everything. And it's a great place to live because it's very funny. You make a movie, you, you literally wait 18 months or two years to hear your first laugh. You just, because there's writing it, there's casting it, there's pre-production, there's filming it, there's post-production. Finally, you try it out in some theater in Pasadena and you hear people laugh. And you say, oh, oh. It's funny, it's good, you know. But when you do a Broadway musical, you put, you, you put a dress rehearsal on stage, 100 people come in to take a look at it, and you hear laughter. And the only payment for a comedy writer, the only payment, besides money, is laughter. It's the only real payment. The Villagers with the Torches is a convention in all the Frankenstein films, and it started with the first one in 1931. Uh, the, the angry mob gets outraged over something awful the monster has done, and they're going to get it. 
Contrary to belief in the original Frankenstein, the villagers never stormed the castle because they're too busy out hunting the monster in the mountains and the fields. But the castle is stormed in Son of Frankenstein. Uh, it is stormed even more so in Ghost of Frankenstein, where they set uh, a fire to it. So the Brooks is, of course, very happy to bring in all the villagers with torches and, and haymakers and rakes, uh, all the usual instruments of, uh, of uh, mayhem. Some of the townspeople are British. <laughs> yes. And some of the townspeople are German. It, Whoa, someone should at some point say, like, hey, guys, are we going to... It doesn't matter doesn't at matter. all because it completely works. It works however that line sounds funniest is, is exactly... <laughs> you know, that's... that's Go, go with it. That's, it doesn't matter. That's the great thing about the Mel Brooks movies is, like, there's no... It wasn't... It, you can tell it's not a committee. What's what's winning out in every scene is, was it funny or not? Yeah. Every time we, we, we'd break and they'd open those big studio doors... You'd see a lot of people crowding in for autographs because suddenly Gene and I were famous for blazing saddles, you know. But uh, it was. It was a thrilling Robert Young, th that wonderful actor who ended up doing a good job, you know, uh, Marcus Welby on television. But, but years ago, he was really a great black-and-white film actor. And he used to drop by and, and sit and sit in a chair in one of the canvas chairs to watch us shooting and talk to us. And people like Walter Pigeon of, of M MGM, you know, Dr. Curie of Madame Curie, and and uh, and uh, Mrs. Miniver. He was always seemed to be married to that same redhead, you know, Greg Garson. Couldn't get away from Greg, but he would drop by, and all these actors would come by to to because they knew something special was happening on that set. And they, and they just wanted to watch it. The hairdo that Madeline Kahn wears at the end of the film uh, it, uh, goes back to, of course, The Bride of Frankenstein and Elsa Lanchester's get up in the last few minutes of that film. Jack Pierce's makeup for her has sutures running through her neck, uh, cherry stone kissed lips, and this incredible upswept marcelled hairpiece with streaks like lightning bolts running up through them. Uh, one of the most arresting images in any of the horror pictures. The idea behind the look, especially the hair and, uh, and, and the lightning bolts that are suggested by it, are, are directly related to how she was created through electricity. The thing I remember was you're watching them shoot this comedy movie, you were aware that it was a classic while they were making it, that something magical was going on. You were aware that it was really funny. Um, you could see behind the camera the crew, you know, trying not to laugh and biting their hands. So you're aware there was hilarity going on. And, and obviously sometimes people would blow the takes because they're like, so you're aware there was something really, really funny going on. But you're also aware that there was something moving happening. There was something delicate there was emotion going on. There was a lot of love between the performers, but also in the characters on screen, particularly between Gene Wilder as Dr. Frankenstein and his creation, Peter Boyle as the monster. There was a love story going on there. People say, you know, I've, I've got, first days, I've got the video, I never stopped watching it. Now it's, I got the DVD, I got the DVD, I never stopped watching it, I see it every night, I watch it every night, and now I'll hear, in, in a few months, I got the Blu-ray. I watch it every night. I know I'm going to hear that. I loved making Young Frankenstein, I think, more than any other movie I've ever made. And I'm so happy that it's being presented in, in such ecstatic and, 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 and beautiful form because it's, uh, it's, it's going to be the crispest, most beautiful black and white film ever, ever presented. So uh, I thank you, Blu-ray, for doing that for us. So, that's all, folks. <laughs>